My dear brothers and sisters, we're on the last part of our um, study series on Hezekiah the Great. And we've been considering what a wonderful reformer he was. How, compared with his father Ahaz, he brought the people from the brink of disaster and neglect of the things that matter all the way back to their God and close affinity with their God. Then we spoke about him as a great leader in the time when he was supposed to be strong and lifted up. He was desperately ill, and we know that he led the people through that terrible time of the siege of Jerusalem. And then tonight, brothers and sisters, we're going to look at Hezekiah as the great repenter. And we'll see what happens with Hezekiah tonight. And we'll see that he's great even in his repentance to his father. So just connecting a little bit back to where we were last week, we know that there were three great shadows that had lain heavily upon Hezekiah. The first was the sickness and death that he was suffering from, the imminent death, and that was lifted from Hezekiah. Then, of course, there were the threatening Assyrians who were threatening the very life of the people and the whole institution of Jerusalem and the last vestiges of Judah. And that was lifted. And then the last shadow that had to be lifted was truly the enslavement of the people to sin and their foolishness and their crazy partings when they thought that they had uh, tricked their way out of a bad situation, running off to Egypt for assistance. And all of that enslavement was going to be lifted and Hezekiah would stand once again unaffected by those three great shadows in the glory of God. But it was not just merely enough for God to remove those shadows. Yahweh created three great blessings for Hezekiah. He created a blessing of abundant life, not only for Hezekiah in his extended life, but for the nation as a whole. He granted Hezekiah and the people a great peace, a wonderful time of peace, very similar to the wonderful 14 years that he had originally had, but even with more peace in some ways. And then finally, restoration, restoration of the things that were lost and had been uh, broken down through these circumstances, through all the pillage and destruction of the Assyrians. All those things came back as three great blessings. And all of these wonderful blessings are mentioned in a beautiful section from Isaiah 37. And in Isaiah 37 at verse 30, the, the prophet says on behalf of Yahweh, and this shall be a sign unto thee. And just, just bear in mind that word that I've highlighted there, sign. This is a token to you, Hezekiah. You shall eat this year such as growth of itself, and the second year, that which springeth of the same, and in the third year, sow ye, and reap, and plant vineyards, and eat the fruit thereof. So it's talking of a three-year blessing that God was going to give to not only Hezekiah, but to the whole land and all the people in it. And of course, we know on the right that this abundant life that was spoken of was a year of jubilee. Yahweh was causing a year of jubilee to be celebrated in the land. And we know from Leviticus, and if you shall say, what shall we eat the seventh year? Behold, we shall not sow, nor gather, in, uh, gather our increase. Then I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, says Yahweh, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years. So what Yahweh was doing was giving great fructification to the, the land, that it would yield its, its blessings so that the people wouldn't have to worry about agriculture. They could rebuild their homes and their lives in Judah and the surrounding territories without having to worry about agriculture. They were being fed and watered from heaven in this great jubilee. And then Isaiah 37 continues, and he says in verse 31, that the remnant that has escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion, 
the zeal of Yahweh hosts shall do this. The Yahweh armies, it's a militant title. And of course, we know that the Jubilee, that abundant life was extended to the true owners of the land. Remember, around about Jerusalem, all of Judah had been overtaken by the Assyrians. All of those people were to get their land back. Land restoration to all of those who had been disenfranchised by the Assyrian invasion. But there was something more to it than just that. Because you see, the description here is that they're going to be rooted once again and bear fruit upward. And that lovely pattern is a great scriptural model that we have to be grounded in the right things to bear fruit upwards to God. And in so doing, Yahweh then rewards that fruit with rain. And it's a wonderful virtuous cycle. Therefore, it can bear more fruit. That goes all the way back to Genesis, that cycle. But what else was it talking about here? Well, quite literally, the, the Jews, particularly Judah, were under the heel of the Assyrians. And, and this literally is a freeze of uh, a prisoner under the heel of one of the Syri Assyrian kings. They literally did that to show that they were over the, the uh, prisoners. Absolutely horrible position to be in with your face crushed into the ground. And the remarkable thing is, this prophecy of Isaiah applied to a great group of people to, who were returning to Jerusalem and Judah. The remnant that has escaped off the house of Judah shall again take root. There was a remnant of the restoration of slaves and of captives. Those who had been captured in the surrounding areas, remember the 46 cities around in Judah that had fallen to the Assyrians, and that vast host of people had been taken away by Sennacherib. Those people were going to return to their own land. And then Isaiah continues to say in verse 30, uh, Isaiah 37, verse 33, Thus saith Yahweh concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into the city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shields, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith Yahweh. Now, we may think, well, that was just the one instance, but it was for all time. One of the other parallel references actually speaks about God literally putting a hook in his nose and dragging him all the way back to Nineveh from whence he had, had come. And the point is that Sennacherib, after his defeat, would never, ever return to Judah. And it's a remarkable thing, scripturally, that we tend to think Sennacherib went back to Nineveh and was then killed by his sons. It appears he lived for about 19 years before his two sons killed him in the house of his God. Yet in all that time, he never returned to Judah. He had gone on a number of very successful campaigns, including against people who were very close by, in, in, in geographical sense, to Judah, and he never invaded the land again. So what God had said absolutely remained. He would not come into that city ever again. So the prophecy of Isaiah was true. Peace was granted to Hezekiah and the people. How did Hezekiah respond to this? But of course, Hezekiah was a wonderful man of God. He had been redeemed from the, the, the bars and the gates of death. And now all of these blessings come upon him and the people. So Hezekiah does two things. Firstly, he praises God in, in the most spectacular psalm, it's a beautiful psalm that's buried in Isaiah 38. Um, spend a little time looking, looking at it because it gives some insights into the psychology of what Hezekiah was thinking when he was at the point of death. He was literally chattering like a bird with fear and anguish. So you can, you can see a lot of what he went through and what was motivating him to pray the way he did. And it was always 
that those in the grave had no means of praising God. And he, he felt it a terrible thing that he wouldn't be able to praise the God of his salvation. That was his true motivation. And at the end of Isaiah 38, he makes this most wonderful pledge. He makes a pledge to Yahweh to praise God for the rest of his days. So it wasn't going to be a singular um, exaltation of joy and of gratitude. He said he wanted to make it part of his daily life. And you can imagine when all of this was over, the, the type of service that he may have led. I mean, there are a number of Psalms that, that could have fit the purpose, and those are some of them I've listed there, where he would have taken existing Psalms and bound them all together in a wonderful paean of praise to God for the redemption that had actually been uh, given to him and to the people. But there's something special about the sons of degrees. Now, remember last week, we looked at what the degrees meant, and the degrees weren't degrees as we know of a compass. The degrees in, in Hebrew always speak about a flight of stairs. And of course, they can be used for, for timekeeping when the shadow moves across certain stairs. You can see what time it is. But it was the song of degrees or the song of ascents. And we know that from where the king lived were a flight of stairs all the way up to the temple. So he would ascend up the flight, the degrees, on the way to the temple. And that's where King Hezekiah's heart was. He was embedded in the temple. And Isaiah 38 says, Yahweh was ready to save me. Therefore, we, therefore, we will sing my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of Yahweh. Now, that's very interesting. We will sing my songs to the stringed instruments. What songs could those be? Well, we know that with Hezekiah, he, he received his 15 extra years, and the songs of degrees, the songs of sense, total 15 psalms. And of course, this was always sung by the pilgrims as they would make their way up to Jerusalem. And of course, the shadow moved backwards by 10 degrees for Hezekiah. And what's fascinating, out of those 15 psalms on the bottom right, 10 of them are by an anonymous psalmist. And I truly believe they were Hezekiah himself. Because they certainly fall by David and one from Solomon. So when he promised to sing his psalms all the days of his life, I truly believe that these ten were put there by Hezekiah himself in the songs of degrees. And we won't spend any time on this. It's, it's a wonderful table that Brother George Booker put together in the Christophian magazine, where he went through the songs of degrees and he allied them to the different conditions in the life um, and times of Hezekiah and the people. A really lovely parallel between those, that fivefold structure and the different um, aspects of Hezekiah's life. I'll have this in the notes for you. You can pick it up later. But there's a lovely further glimpse into Hezekiah's state of mind, and it comes from a very unexpected source. And it is this. This is actually Hezekiah's seal. The seal that was found in the, I think it was 2009 in uh, Jerusalem. And it is actually the seal, the imprint of, of Hezekiah's seal. It's a, it's a tiny little, uh, they call it a bulla. It's, it's about a centimeter across. So it's really small, about the width of your thumb. And this is the imprint in, into clay, and it was baked hard by fire, so it was preserved. And in that script at the bottom, it, this is what it actually says. It was belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. So to think this stamp was on the hand of King Hezekiah, on a, as a, potentially as a ring, and he pressed it into this piece of clay. But what do we see on it? We see on it in the middle a symbol of the sun. There's the sun in the middle, the round section with the rays coming out, but with drooping wings. Now, no self-respecting king would show drooping wings. It was a, a symbol of weakness. 
Many of the others, the Assyrians and others, would have the wings upturned for strength. Hezekiah's got them drooping down. Symbolic of what he went through, that he was at the, 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 the absolute point of death, because here's the universal symbol of life, the ankh, which was known in those days as the symbol of life. It wasn't uniquely Egyptian. It was much like, you know, the heart symbol is, is used um, generically to, to represent romance. This was the symbol that was used to represent life in those days. So from this broken position that Hezekiah was, there was life given. And he's actually made it his seal, recognizing that God gave him life. And another tiny little thing that you, you might not see too well, but if you look at the bottom here, these little ridges here are actually Hezekiah's fingerprints, the ridges of his fingerprint. To think in clay, we've got an absolute imprint of the fingers of this great and wonderful servant of God. So as in the, the time of the siege, the peace and prosperity that God had granted to the people were absolute and, and certain. They bred their water, they, the things they needed to eat and drink were provided for them by Yahweh, as Isaiah 33 uh, tells. And Isaiah 33 also continues with a further description. It describes this condition after the Assyrians were, were slaughtered by God. And it says in verses 1 and 4, Woe to thee that spoilest the Assyrians, and thou wast not spoiled in return, and dealest treacherously, and they dealt not treacherously with thee in return. When thou shalt cease to spoil, thou shalt be spoiled. So what this is saying is that the Assyrians had taken a great amount of spoil, and they were gathered around Jerusalem, and then the next verse, verse 4 says, your spoil shall be gathered like the gathering of the caterpillar. In other words, others are going to take it from you as the running to and fro of locusts shall he, it's actually the inhabitants of Jerusalem, run upon them. This was the plunder of the Syrian camp by the people of Jerusalem. They had gone and gathered wealth from all over the area and they had it in their mighty camp thinking it was safe in their hands. And it was anything but. It was pillaged, almost as if a stream of locusts was going out from the city, picking up all the, the gold and the silver and all the valuables and bringing it back into the city. Now, the ripple effect of what Yahweh had done, his intervention here with the Assyrians, had a, a major effect upon all of the surrounding countries. If you see two armies go down towards Judah and only one come back, all the surrounding nations start asking questions. You can't move that number of people and not see the difference. So the fact that Yahweh had humbled the Assyrian army made a lot of people round about start to believe that in Zion, God is known. It was the place where the true God is, is, is uh, residing. And now remember there was a concept that those people used to believe. They believed that there would be a God linked to you and your tribe or to a territory. So they started to say, what is it about this territory that has this God who is so powerful? So they started attributing these, these uh, great things of God to that territory, to Zion. And of course, this made Hezekiah a very attractive ally. Imagine if you are worried about your, your position, status as a nation. So a lot of people brought gifts to the Lord, to Jerusalem, and presents. The, the revised version has precious things, great uh, amount of value to Hezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was exalted in the sight of all nations from thenceforth. Hezekiah was lifted up because of the things that God had done for him. So the net benefit was elevation of the man of one's God's choosing. And of course, you can see all the analogies here to the Lord Jesus Christ in the future age. And of course, Hezekiah became the king in the Middle East. You had to fear, 
and preferably be courted. It'd be great to have him as an ally. 185,000 men in one night were felled by his God. What a great ally to have. And we know this was the case because Isaiah 49 at verse 7, 22 and 23 describes it as, Kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship because of Yahweh that is faithful. God was faithful to Ezekiah and as a consequence, God says, I will lift up my hand upon the, unto the Gentiles and set up my standard to the people. And kings shall be thy nursing fathers and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth. Now, you and I know that Isaiah 49, Isaiah 60, much of Isaiah is actually pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. But we fail if we don't understand that Isaiah was prophesying concurrently with the life of Hezekiah. It overlapped most with Hezekiah, and so did Micah. So for the prophet, much of their message had to be understood in the day in which it was given. And it was certainly given to the people for them to understand, because they could actually see it physically happening in, in, in shadow in the life of Hezekiah. So when we read Isaiah end to end, we should be looking for primarily Hezekiah to start with, and then, of course, the greater than Hezekiah to come. Psalm 76 has the following to say, The stout-hearted, the Assyrians, are spoiled. They have slept their sleep, and none of the men of might have found their hands, no strength in their hands. At thy rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariot and horse are cast into a dead sleep. Therefore, the consequence, as the psalmist continues, is thou and pay unto Yahweh your God. Let all that be round about him bring presents unto him that ought to be feared. And this was the consequence of what actually happened to the nations round about. They did see these things and they did fear and they did bring presents to Hezekiah, king of Judah and Jerusalem. And Isaiah 60, we know, is a kingdom chapter. Absolutely. But when you read it with the understanding that this was primarily, in the first instance, linked to Hezekiah's reign, it all fits together so beautifully. And of the blessing from heaven? Well, we know in Isaiah 55, verse 13, instead of the expected thorn, the Assyrian is going to come up the fir tree. And instead of the ineradicable briar, the, the briar that you can't eradicate, is going to come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to Yahweh for a name and for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. There again is the sign that Hezekiah had asked for, and Yahweh was providing it in all the things that he was doing for, for Hezekiah and for the nation. His token, his ensign, was being planted in the earth. This was one of the wine storehouses of Hezekiah near Beersheba, just for wine. What a wine collection. Hezekiah, as Chronicles tells us, had exceeding much riches and honor, and he made himself treasuries for silver and for gold and for precious stones and for spices and for shields and for all manner of instruments of desire, appears to be musical instruments, Storehouses also for the increase of corn and wine and oil and stalls for all manner of beasts and flocks. Moreover, he provided him cities and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance, for God had given him very much substance. This was a wonderful blessing that Yahweh had caused to be given to this nation that was just a few months before in total deprivation under siege conditions within the city walls, and heaven's bounty is opened upon the people. And as we said that the release of the captives from Assyria was a massive number. Remember under Ahaz, Ahaz had, had tried by paying tribute to the Assyrians to, to assure them of his fealty and, and goodness to them, that he let the noble families of, of the city of Jerusalem be taken off 
into captivity as a guarantee that he wouldn't turn against the king of Assyria. So the noble families and around about 200,000 captives from Judah all started streaming back to the land. We've got to get an understanding of this because in the times of Nebuchadnezzar, it was only around about 50,000 people that were taken. This was four times or more larger in terms of the return to the land than were ever taken out in the times of Nebuchadnezzar. We keep thinking that's the great reduction of Judah. This was the time of the reduction and restoration of Judah under Hezekiah's reign. And as they came over, after marching for thousands of kilometers through the barren deserts, they came to this beautiful land with Mount Tabor in the background, and they could smell the air of home once again. Isaiah 11 says, He shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Absolutely futuristic too, but it applied here at this time. And there shall be an highway for the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria. Like as it was to Israel on the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. You see the analogy with the Passover out of Egypt and the escape here from the Assyrian lands. Isaiah 27 continues, It shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet, the trumpet of the Jubilee from Leviticus 25, shall be blown and they shall come, which were ready to perish, where? In the land of Assyria. They'd given up all hope of returning. And they shall worship Yahweh in the holy mount of Jerusalem. They were coming home. And they would see those city walls which their eyes had given up ever seeing ever again. And Isaiah 35 records, the ransomed of Yahweh shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. How can they sing the Lord's song in that strange land? Well, they were able to sing it when they were returned to the place of their nativity back in the land of Judah and Jerusalem. Then a remarkable thing took place. Hezekiah married. Remember the whole point of Hezekiah's appeal to Yahweh was that he was going to die with no heir. Therefore, God's promises to David would come to an end. So at this point, a further blessing is given that Hezekiah marries. And the product of that marriage is the heir that was required um, for the continuance of the line of David. Now, we can't be 100% sure, but it seems highly likely that this bride, the bride of Hezekiah, would have been a Gentile bride. There are a number of reasons for it. Of course, we know Psalm 45 is the psalm that prefigures the bride of, of Christ and the marriage of Christ to, to his, his bride. But in Psalm 45, verse 12, out of all the nations that could have been mentioned there, she is described as the daughter of Tyre. Now, we know that when Assyria was on the ascendancy and was the great power threatening the whole area, and particularly Judah, the king of Tyre had actually given his support to the Assyrians. He was on the other side. Psalm 83 actually indicates that. So the king of Tyre was actually against Judah, but the tide has certainly turned. Now the king of Judah is in the ascendancy. And it's very possible that the king of Tyre offered his daughter politically to seal the peace with Judah. This is what kings do. They've done it throughout all the ages, offering their, their uh, children to other nations so that there would be lasting peace. This is not the only clue. The interesting thing is, we know her name. 
but we know what her name became. Here's an interesting thing. Have a look at the continuance of Psalm 45 at verse 10. In Psalm 45 verse 10, there's this interesting little phrase. It says, hearken, O daughter, forget also thine own people and thy father's house. Why would a daughter have to forget her people and her father's house? The only time it actually happened was the provision under the law for when somebody who was Jewish took a Gentile bride. And she had to bewail the fact that she had left her Gentile roots and was now being part of Israel. And then for a period of a month, the Jewish husband was to see whether he took pleasure in her, that she was a suitable wife. If not, the law had a provision that at the end of the month, the marriage could be annulled and she could go her own way and the marriage would be dissolved and over. Isn't it fascinating then that in 2 Kings 21 at verse 1, she's renamed, and I say renamed because this is a Jewish name, a Hebrew name. She's actually renamed Hepzibah, which means my delight is in her. So in other words, it's as if he married her, spent time with her according to the law, the provision for marrying a Gentile bride, and then renamed her with this Jewish name, my delight is in her. And those very words are used in the law. If he does not delight in her, she is free to leave. So she's actually called Hepzibah in 2 Kings 21 verse 1. And another little clue, possibly, is that the child of this union was Manasseh. And Manasseh means causing to forget. So she may have been homesick. Obviously, she had to bewail the fact that she had to leave her Gentile roots. But when the child is born, she's forgetting all of her past. Very interesting possibility of tying all of those together. And quite interestingly, too, because this points to Christ taking on a bride who was of Gentile roots. That Christ was not only married to Israel, but married to the wild olive tree that was grafted in as well. Isaiah 62 gives some other lovely clues there as well. You can look at those in your own time. But then came a terrible time of testing for Hezekiah. It was almost as if everything was just too good to be true. It was all absolutely perfect. You couldn't imagine a better set of circumstances. Everything was right. But this is what was happening at that time. There may have been peace for Judah and Jerusalem, but there wasn't peace in the whole area. There were three great poles of power. Assyria up in the north, and Assyria hadn't gone anywhere. Assyria was certainly powerful. In fact, after Sennacherib, Assyria actually extended its reach far further than Sennacherib had managed, all the way down into Egypt. Remember that they had uh, problems with the great strong uh, black pharaohs of Egypt, how powerful they were, and had defeated the Assyrians so many times. So the Assyrians were still a very powerful pole. The Egyptians were very wealthy, very powerful, could command great forces. And of course, Israel was always tempted, Israel and Judah tempted to run down to Egypt for assistance. But there was another interesting pole, and it was down here in Babylon. And, you know, the Assyrian territory took in into its sway a number of sub-countries or, or sub-tribes. Uh, there was the Babylonians, and then down south towards the Persian Gulf, the Chaldeans, down here, Ur of the Chaldees. So there are these other people who are under the sway of Assyria, but not Assyrian. And then, of course, against all of this is this tiny little island, this tiny little island. And think about it like this. Here you've got the Assyrian Empire, and this was under Sennacherib, the extent of his, his reign, as far as we can gather, a vast territory. So the Elamites over here, Susan, the, uh, the, the palace over here, where eventually uh, Nehemiah was installed as, as the governor, the Chaldeans here, uh, Babylon here, Assyria here, 
Syria to the north was included, all the little vassal states all the way down. And then, look at it, it literally stops just north of Jerusalem. What was it about this tiny, tiny little city-state and surrounding um, areas that was able to hold off this entire Syrian empire? It was intriguing to the minds of a lot of rulers in those, those days. And this news spread, but particularly to somebody we've spoken about before, Meridan Baladan. Now, remember in the first 14 years of the reign of Hezekiah, God had granted him great peace. And the reason was, and I'll just go back two slides for a moment, that Meridak Baladan was a Babylonian king based down here in the south. And he was causing so much trouble to the Assyrians further north that it occupied the Syrians from moving down west into Judah. And that's the reason why Hezekiah had his 14 years of peace. So when this little city-state is effectively, in his eyes, able to push back Assyria, he was extremely curious. He was a tough, tireless warrior. He never gave up. The Assyrians had no end of trouble with him because he just wouldn't roll over and, and capitulate. In fact, he was ruler over Babylon on two occasions, defeated, and then he came back again before being finally routed. And the reason why he was so popular amongst the people is he was truly a Babylonian royal. They hated the Assyrians because they weren't Babylonians. They, they were usurpers in their eyes. The Babylonians were the real kings of Babylon. So Meridak Baladan, a cunning man, a great politician, a, a vicious warrior, set his eyes on Judah. And what was it about Judah that was special? Now Meridak Baladan, and, and that's his Babylonian name underneath, means, very interestingly, Marduk has given me an heir. And Marduk, of course, as we know, was the patron god of Babylon. He, he was the top god, top of the pantheon of the, the Babylonians. In other words, he was god of gods of the Babylonians. And this frieze on the wall is this um, hybrid creature of half-snake, um, it's, it's got the talons of, of an eagle, paws of a lion, uh, this, this hybrid um, animal um, that was supposedly the symbol of Marduk. And what's so interesting is that Meridak Baladan's name means Marduk has given me an heir. Now just think about what's happening here. Hezekiah has been given an heir by this wonderful, gracious provision of Yahweh, this Gentile, Gentile bride, and from this has come the seed. And all of a sudden, another man who says that Marduk has given me an heir appears on the scene. There's a conflict being set up here at a spiritual level between these two. And we read in 2 Kings 20 at verse 12, at that time, Meridak Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present. He sent a whole lot of people with them to Hezekiah, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And Second Chronicles 32, verse 31, and he wanted to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land on the sundial of Ahaz. Really? Was he really interested in sending a get well present and card to um, Hezekiah or a congratulations card? Absolutely not. He had sent a very special delegation all the way through to, to Judah and Jerusalem to be able to see and spy on what was going on there. And no doubt, because he was always in league with the Chaldeans, that not only Babylonian princes had gone, but certainly some of the Chaldean astronomers, uh, astrologers and soothsayers had gone with the delegation as well to inquire of the wonder on the sundial of Ahaz. And here's the tragedy. Those people come to Hezekiah, and what happens? With all their soft words and their gifts, Hezekiah hearkened to them. He listened to these people who were worshipping Marduk. 
As Deuteronomy 16 verse 9 says, a gift does blind the eyes of the wise and pervert the words of the righteous. My word, it did it with Hezekiah. He was totally taken in with them. And what God says, as recorded for us in 2 Chronicles 32 at verse 31, God left Hezekiah. Not literally, he had blessed him, but he left him through the presence of Isaiah. Now remember, Isaiah was the elder tutor of Hezekiah through his life. Isaiah pulled himself back from Hezekiah. God left him to try him, that he might know all that was in his heart. Like Solomon was tried, under very similar circumstances. And what did he do? 2 Kings 20, verse 30, 13. And Hezekiah showed them all the house of his precious things. The silver, the gold, the spices, the precious ointment from the temple. That was holy and its, its compounding was only for the priests. And all the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasures, there was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. He opened it all up to these followers of Marduk who were coming there with completely devious intent. And in this is a very interesting phrase. It was a very interesting principle in scripture. A weak friend was able to accomplish that which was impossible for a powerful foe. His weak friend, Meredek Baladan, who was being defeated by the Assyrians, was able to soft soap his way into Hezekiah's mind and thinking, where all the force of Sennacherib and his army failed. And this is a great lesson to any of us, my dear brothers and sisters. Somebody who's influential on us and is weak spiritually can do far more damage than a very visible and powerful foe. 2 Chronicles 32 verse 25 tells us the telling reason why Hezekiah went like this. That Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him. In other words, God opened the gates of Hezekiah heaven in blessing to him, but he didn't render them back to God. Well, we know he, he thanked God. What does it mean, render back? Well, what I think it actually means is when these people came through, instead of saying, all of this is God's blessing, it was none of my doing, it says in the next part of the verse, his heart was lifted up. He started bragging about it as if it was his doing. Therefore, there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. The king was a great leader. When his heart was lifted up, so was the heart of the people. They followed him. And they were also lifted up with pride, with the magnificence of their reign. There's got to be something good about us if all of this is coming upon us. And the telling words of Psalm 146 are there. But not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. And we'll see what Hezekiah was up to here in a moment. The problem with this heart being lifted up is that the Proverbs have something specific to say. And this is God speaking. God says, I hate pride and arrogance. Not I like, dislike it a little. It was one of the key things God hates, pride and arrogance. Being lifted up and being haughty and thinking more of oneself than one should is what God absolutely despises. It's replacing God and his greatness with us and our fake greatness. God hates it. Hezekiah didn't stop there. He drafted and signed this treaty with these people, Meredith Baladan. Meredith Baladan couldn't I'm sure believe his great joy with what was happening. I mean, he wasn't there physically. He had sent emissaries. But this pact, this treaty of friendship and support wasn't just, well, you know, yes, we'll be friends as they shook hands. This was a political allegiance because Meredith Baladan was trying to join an axis of himself, 
in Babylon, the Egyptians to the southwest, and Hezekiah just to the north, in a three-party alliance against the king of Assyria. That was his real um, objective, is to beat the king of Assyria and take over all of Assyria for himself. And Hezekiah fell for it. But Isaiah didn't. Isaiah, the prophet who had withdrawn himself from Hezekiah for a while, says this to Hezekiah. What said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? He asks them two, two questions. Hezekiah is awkward. He doesn't know what to answer. Isaiah knew what the answers were to those questions. It wasn't as if he was asking, didn't know. Second Kings 6 verse 12 tells us, Isaiah knew what was in the king's mind in his bedchamber, as God revealed it to him. He was trying to see what Hezekiah would answer. Hezekiah says, all the things that are in my house have they seen. He only answers the second question. He doesn't answer the first one. What did these men say? What were they after, says Isaiah. And the reason for it is what Hezekiah answers. They came to see the things in my house. And I showed them. What's the harm in that? Terrible harm, unfortunately. Second Kings 20, Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of Yahweh. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house, all, and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day. So not only you, you are doing despite to everything that your predecessors have laid up in store, shall be carried into Babylon. These people will be your downfall. Nothing shall be left. It'll be scraped clean, says Yahweh. And here's the frightening one. Remember, the whole issue was, who's the heir? Marduk has given me a son. Hezekiah had been given a son. And of these sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon? Eunuchs unable to sire children? Is this the end of your line? What have you done, Hezekiah? Everything is coming to naught. Imagine Hezekiah's heart. And what happened here in the single foolish move of Hezekiah was a 250-year-long shadow of consequences. Now, we know that Yahweh was, is, is God of all, God of heaven and earth. Everything is in his domain. And remember, we spoke earlier about people believing that their gods were gods of their territory or of their kings. Yahweh is God of all. But what had happened? Sennacherib, who followed the god Asher from Assyria, had vaunted himself up against the god of heaven. His territory had been extended all the way around the Fertile Crescent to engulf Judah. So Yahweh defeated him. He entered, Yahweh, the God of all, had entered into the realm of the God of Asher and shown him to be nothing and defeated him. Then we've got Merodach Baladan, who worshipped Marduk in Babel. And the God of the Babylonians now was again pit, pit, pitched in, in conflict with the God of all heaven and all earth, the living God. And here's the failure of Hezekiah. Instead of it being a defeat, Hezekiah invited them into the temple, potentially even to see the inauguration of the new high priest, as one commentator had said. A great tragedy around 700 BC. And Manasseh turned out to be a really nasty child, a child who erred greatly and undid a lot of what his father did, the good of his father. But judgment was deferred on Manasseh all the way to the last king of Judah, Zedekiah. And then Zedekiah and Judah were taken to Babylon, as the prophet had said, by King Nebuchadnezzar, 
There were three waves of, of captivity that were, were uh, undertaken by Nebuchadnezzar, and the last one around about 605 BC. So what Isaiah had said came to pass. And the eunuch, Daniel, went to Babylon. The eunuch, Daniel, from the princely house, went to Babylon. And his name is the judgment of Ale. God is bringing judgment upon not only Judah, but upon this other God that vaunts himself up against the God of heaven and earth. Because some 70 years later, Belshazzar was having a feast, and that feast was a religious festival. They were worshipping their gods, including Marduk, and they needed to do something to show their subjugation of all the other gods, including the god of Judah. So they brought in the, in the absence of having any idols, they bring in all the other idols from Edom and Moab. What do you bring for Judah that you've shown that your god is better than them? Nothing. So you bring in the elements from the temple that you've stolen, all the things of gold and silver, and you feast on them in, in that, that great feast. So Yahweh intervenes in the space of the God of Babylon and Marduk directly. You think you're over me? Yahweh is the God of heaven and earth. And the finger of Yahweh wrote on the wall. And Daniel, the judgment of El, had to interpret it. And he was elevated, of course, and Darius the Mede, the very, that, that very night, took over from Belshazzar and slew him. In 539 BC. But restoration was not yet. It had to go all the way through to the times of Artaxerxes I, the Persian king, and around about 444 BC, when the captives would be allowed to return under the work of Nehemiah. Because under Nehemiah, they found the scrolls, in uh, the Babylonian scrolls, that Daniel had been caused to write because he had been elevated to third in the empire. And of course, the work of Daniel, the judgment of El, was now complete on Marduk. And what happens? The restoration of the captives is complete, and Yahweh is victorious over Marduk. And the position that this whole chart started with, where Yahweh was defeating the kings, has now ended in the restoration of the captives coming back to their land under Nehemiah. That was 250 years of pain through one bad judgment of Hezekiah. His heart must have been broken for what he did. Imagine him. This man who put God first in all things had failed. Then said Hezekiah unto Isaiah, in an instant Hezekiah reverts to his own self. Pride is burst like a bubble. Good is the word of Yahweh, which thou hast spoken. Even though it was terrible for him in his line, it is good because it's Yahweh's. And he said, is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? And that's a little bit hard to understand, perhaps. There are two other renderings. Surely there shall be peace and truth in my days. It was a rhetorical appeal to God. Please, God, let there be peace and truth in my days. Or potentially, shall it not be, if I repent, that there will be peace and truth in my days? Hezekiah was a broken man. But he does, it does show that he wasn't the object, the final object of all the wonderful prophecies of Isaiah. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we think of Moses, we think of David, we think of Hezekiah in all of these great failures, yet God would redeem them all. And the reason why Hezekiah was re redeemed is the focal point for this last talk, because he repented greatly. Second Chronicles 32 verse 26 says, Notwithstanding, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, he realized where the source of the problem was. It was his own heart, and his own pride, and he did something about it. Both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, he taught them that they had also failed, and he led them 
into a path of righteousness once again. As a consequence, that great wish we had just read came to pass. So the wrath of Yahweh came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah. The consequences were there and they did come to pass. But Hezekiah was spared it for his righteousness. God can redeem even these great errors of judgment. So in the final estimation then, we read in 2 Chronicles 32, now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and all his goodness. Behold, they are written in the vision of Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, and in the book of the kings of Israel. This is giving us a clue that we ought to read Isaiah with a view to Hezekiah very carefully. And Hezekiah slept with his fathers and they buried him in the chiefest of all the sepulchres of the sons of David. And Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem did honor him at his death. This was in contradistinction to what had happened to his father Ahaz. Remember, even though he was the king of Israel, uh, Judah, what did they do? They didn't even bury him with the kings of Israel. But he's given the chiefest of sepulchres of the sons of David, honored and loved by his people. And perhaps this that was in our readings recently this week was a telling verse because it's heaven's own summation of Hezekiah himself. Hezekiah trusted. If that's the summary of what Hezekiah's life is, it is that Hezekiah trusted. He had faith in Yahweh, God of Israel, so that after him was none like him, among any of the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him, because he had faith in Yahweh, God of Israel, above all things. If there's any indication to us, brothers and sisters, what God requires of us, that he would like to see in the estimation of our lives, is that phrase, he trusted in Yahweh. So indeed, brothers and sisters, Hezekiah was the great. He was the great reformer, the great leader, and indeed the great repenter. And for that, he certainly will be great in the kingdom of God. And it will be wonderful to speak to him. <laughs>